Turn to song number 476. 476. We're not going to sing it. We are going to read it. Just want to look at the first verse. The emphasis of really one is on the chorus. First verse beginning. Of Jesus' love that sought me when I was lost in sin. Of wondrous grace that brought me back to his fold again. Of height and depth of mercy far deeper than the sea and higher than the heavens. My theme shall ever be. And then we sing. Sweeter as the years go by. Sweeter as the years go by. Richer, fuller, deeper. Jesus' love is sweeter. Sweeter as the years go by. In John 10, in verse 10, Christ said that He came that we might have life and might have it more abundant. Now, I would definitely emphasize the spiritual life, not a materialist, social kind of gospel thing, but rather those inner things, those intangible values that truly make life wonderful regardless of what you may have materially. And understanding this, that Christianity, when we do understand it and engage the discipline process that began at baptism truly is sweeter as the years go by. And those of us who have been Christians for many years can look back over the years and we can kind of chart our development and see where we've been and how our attitudes and our thoughts have changed. And Christianity is a, a little odd in that we chart our age with birthdays. And that's a pretty regular occurrence about every 365 days. In Christianity, we don't mark birthdays. And it would be a little difficult to do so because some people enter the discipline of Christianity and they pretty much stall out right there. They stay on square one. They figure they got their ticket punched. Everything's okay. What do they need to worry about? They don't quite get it, do they? Others get into it and they bumble along, they stumble along, and eventually they get stronger and better and mature. But they take a while. That's okay. We're glad they stuck with it. And then others get into it and they have a passion and desire and an eagerness and an enthusiasm and they press on the upward way and they move along with blazing speed and they're quite an example and we think, man, they're on fire. And so it'd be a little hard to put the days to it and say, well, this is your you know, first birthday in Christ. You ought to be at this point and so on and so forth. Now, we can do that with youngsters, you know, like the babies, but how do you do that with a babe in Christ? It's a little difficult to do. So as in Christ, as sweeter as the years go by, things just keep getting better. I didn't ask Dave to lead it, but he led a great song there, that one we just sang, 459. I'm in the way, the bright and shiny way. I'm in the glory land way. And, and that's one reason why I think it's appropriate to say that Christians ought to be among some of the happiest people on planet Earth. They ought to be a people who look like they're going somewhere pleasant, like they have something optimistic to look forward to instead of all doom and gloom and sorrow and what have you. Now, I know life has its ups and downs, and I know there are going to be times of mourning and sorrow and those kind of things. But overall, if you would, it ought to be a pretty good life because we are in the way, the bright and shiny way. We are heading on. And so we have this life, this moving on the upward way kind of thing going on, which makes it sweeter as the years go by. And I think that is just a, a wonderful place to be and a wonderful discipline to be engaged in, one that makes your life better as the years unfold because they are going to unfold one way or the other. Now, this sweetness that we learn, it is learned. It is not something that happens from a spectator point of view. We do not want to be spectators. We don't want to be people who just sit in the bleachers and watch everybody else live their life. As a side point, that's one of my objections to too much TV. Is when you're watching TV, you're watching people live their dreams. I want to get out and live my dreams. Now, a little R&R &R is good for you. A little rest and recreation. We're not going to complain. But don't, don't get too much in any spectator activity because you've got a life to live and you get this one life. And you want to get out there and you want to live it with focus and you want to live it with intention. And in Christ, if it truly is going to be sweeter as the years go by, it is going to be because you got off the bleachers, you got on the field, and you did with focus and intention engage the discipline process that makes it exactly that. Now, if you just sit in the bleachers, for Christians that would be pews, wouldn't it? If you just sit inactive, passive in the pews for all those years, uh, you might get a little bit by osmosis perhaps, but never like the guy who hits the locker room and gets on the field and so on and so forth and really engages it. What we're going to do in this lesson is we're going to look at some of the aspects, and certainly not exhaustive, but we're going to look at some aspects that does make it sweeter as the years go by. And I want to just encourage you in that direction to keep your focus and to keep plugging away and so that sometimes, somewhere in your year, you stop and you reflect back and you can see your growth and your development. You know, and whenever that happens, I don't know how, but it happens from time to time, I hope. 
and you can say, I'm glad I've been on this road. I can see I'm making progress. It might take you some months, it might take you some years, but it's progress nonetheless, and there's no better progress that you can make than sweeter as the years go by. Let's start with prayer as why it should be sweeter as the years go by. He says here, confess your trespasses one another, pray for one another, you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. One of the things that makes the Christian life sweet is that when we are a righteous person, we have a prayer life that, as James says, it avails much. We're not isolated. We're not all alone. We have talked from time to time in our private conversations about people who have nobody. They have no one to turn to. They don't have a church family. They don't have a social circle. And we ponder how do they do that? How do they get through the things of life without somebody to talk to, someone to lean upon, and especially a Heavenly Father to turn to who says, you know, if you're really diligent following me, if you're righteous, as James said, then your prayer is going to count for something. His ears, as he would say in 1 Peter, he said, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to the prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. When we live the life that He called us to live, and we truly endeavor in the straight and narrow way. And we know, and we know that we know that we've been, been endeavoring to be righteous as He called us to be. And that His eyes are upon us and His ears are open to us. How could it not be sweeter as the years go by? That is because this is how He put it together. So that we have this developing relationship with Him in prayer. You know how we say it very quickly. We say, reading the Bible, that's God talking to me. Prayer, that's me talking to God. A relationship that is built in prayer. And thus we have Hebrews 4 and 16. We're going to do one more song here. We have Hebrews 4 and 16 that said, We can come boldly before the throne of grace to find before the throne of grace that we may find mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Now, again. What can make life sweeter? Not necessarily that God's going to answer every single thing that I ask Him to. He's not a genie in a bottle, you know, waiting to grant me my three wishes. But it, it gives me an edge. It gives you an insight. And it may be sometime that God's answer to prayer is no, like it was to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when he had the thorn in the flesh. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for thee. It may be that the answer to prayer is, no, I need you to suffer this, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, as he would teach in James chapter 1, verse 2, 3, and 4. But you know, and you know that you know that you have the Heavenly Father up there that's caring and watching, and he's looking and he's listening, and that makes it sweeter as the years go by. Now, this prayer life... Let's use song number 23. I'm not talking now, lay me down to sleep. Forget what kind of car it was in the street. I pray the Lord my soul to keep, you know, the cute little prayers that people like to make up and, and do. When I talk about prayer, I'm talking about prayer. I'm talking about prayer beyond just the public assembly. I'm talking about prayer beyond just mealtime. I believe prayers in the public assembly are very, very appropriate and biblical. I have no problem with them here. I believe prayers before a meal, whether it is private or a group, is extremely appropriate and biblical based. I've got no problem with that. My problem is if that's your only prayer life, you don't get it yet. If that's your only prayer life, then the things that we've talked about in prayer that makes it sweeter as the years go by, you're going to be sitting there puzzling your head going, boy, I don't quite get what he's talking about. Maybe he's had a little too much caffeine today or something. If you can understand what the poet says in the song that we sing, Sweet Hour of Prayer, you'll understand some of the things that I'm talking about. Sweet Hour of Prayer. No, that word hour probably causes some people to go, whoa, wait a minute. You don't mean a real 60 minutes, do you? No, I'll settle for 20 or 30 myself, but nonetheless, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care. What our songwriter is saying is that that time of prayer was a time of refreshing. It was a time of escape. I've got this world of care and trouble out here that's just driving me nuts, making me batty. I've got to have some place of refuge. Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. Bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. Isn't that kind of what we have up here in this verse in James 5, 16? In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief. Not just made a plea, Lord, this is going on, help me. But the prayer was such a prayer life, a established relationship with our Creator, that it found relief in that time of prayer. And off escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petition bear. 
there again, kind of the idea we have there in Hebrews 4, 16, to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless. And since he bids me seek his face, believe his word and trust his grace, I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. That's the prayer life we're talking about. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, my eye thy consolation share, till from Mount Piscop's lofty height I view, view my home and take my flight. This robe of flesh I'll drop and rise. Isn't that a wonderful thought? I don't know if robe's the right word, but that's the word our poet uses, isn't it? We're going to drop off this tent of flesh, seize the everlasting prize, and shout while passing through the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. And I wonder what that little line there, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer, I wonder what the songwriter had in mind. Did, did they have in mind, because when we get in heaven, it's not just going to be an hour. Right now, we get a little time here and a little time there, and we have to tend to the things in life. There's no way around that. But when I get in heaven, it's not going to be an hour of prayer. Maybe, you know, how do you imagine heaven? Maybe to be a whole century of prayer. Maybe to be a whole millennium of prayer, you know? I think mean, time doesn't really relate when you get to heaven. But we're talking about heaven that is an established, ongoing part of the Christian discipline, not just something that we treat as a spare tire. Somewhere along the way, we've had a track. I don't know if we have it anymore, but it was called Don't Treat Prayer Like a Spare Tire. How many of you like it when you have a friend or a family member that the only time they call you is when they need something? Don't you really appreciate that person? Don't you just, don't you just want them to you know, hug them and squeeze them and tweak their cheek? Is they just so cute? Or you want to go, yuck? I wonder why he's calling. God be needing something. That's the only time we're here from him. Now, I have an idea that the reason we have that kind of feeling is because we were created in God's image. And I have an idea that God is no more appreciative of the person that only comes around when they're in need than we are. I think God's probably a little more gracious about it, but we could debate that a little bit. My point is, is you want an established prayer life, an established prayer discipline, so that when you do go to God for that time of need, He's not going, oh, Clarence, is that you? I've kind of been wondering what happened to you. I hadn't seen you around for a few months. But rather, it's been an ongoing thing in your life instead of the spare tire attitude. Now, when prayer becomes that, because that is part of our relationship with God, when it becomes that, then as our title is, sweeter as the years go by, yeah, you'll be sitting around thinking, yes, it is sweeter as the years go by, because that's how it works. Now, let's go on. Now, this follows on the heels of prayer, but we're going to move to the idea of peace. He says, be anxious for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, here again, he came that we might have life and might have it more abundant. I've said in the opening that we ought to be among the happiest people on earth, some of the most confident and contented because we are in that bright and shiny way. We are in the glory land way. And this is partly what he talks about here, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, guarding our hearts. When we have this that grew out of prayer, then we have that sweeter as the years go by, that richer, fuller, deeper kind of thing going on. And we could say with Job, as he said in the first part of verse 13 and 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. The reason we have this peace is because we're looking beyond just the physical life. We have already stuck our head above the cloud of materialism and we've gazed into eternity with the eye of faith as best as we can from this side. Look beyond the tombstone if you would and we've seen that we will be dead a whole lot longer than we'll be alive and we've decided that those things that concern this material life, though we must be responsible, these are also secondary and trivial they don't even compare it to that which is eternal. And thus we take the attitude that he taught us. Don't fear those who can kill the body. And after that, have no more they can do to you. Because we're going to give this body up sooner or later. It's just a matter of when. And for all of us, that when is getting sooner day by day. That's just the way it works. And one of these days, they will lay us down to rest. Hopefully we'll get our 70 to 80 years, as David talked about in Psalms 90:10. But that time is coming for all of us. There's no escape. But when we come to terms with it, and we extend our view beyond the tombstone and we look on into eternity to that relation that's coming, then all of the things that disrupt lives of worldly people and material-minded people, they're no longer that big of a concern. They lose the, the worry factor because I'm looking way beyond this life and over into heaven where my 
treasures are laid up, or as he would say, our inheritance is waiting for us here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved for you. Where? In heaven. And so, sweeter as the years go by is in part is our focus changing from all of the stuff that seems so important in the rat race of life, which incidentally is totally unimportant, but we think it is, especially in our earlier years, to the clearing of our vision and our understanding as we start to get past the halfway mark and get up to the three-quarter mark and, and on, you know, and we start seeing that, you know, the true inheritance that really matters is the one that's reserved for us in heaven. Now, it is the disciple, the disciple that is engaged in that discipline and that training of his mind and his heart and his thinking that can truly sing the song sweeter as the years go by and understand it fully without any great problem. Will there still be ups and downs? Sure, there'll still be ups and downs. Paul had his ups and downs, but he looked with a passion and a desire beyond this life to even that greater life. And that's one of the things that makes it sweeter as the years go by. Now, our third point here is Philippians 4, verse 11 and 12. He says, not that he speaks in regard to need. He'd learned in whatever state he was to be content. He knew how to be abased. He knew how to abound. Everywhere in all things, he'd learned to be full, to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Learning that contentment. Learning, I don't need everything I thought I needed. Now, those of us who are older, remember when you were 16 and remember everything you thought you needed? Are you in your 20s and everything you thought you needed? Or later on, maybe even into your 30s and 40s and everything you thought you needed? But somewhere along the way, if you keep your focus on heaven and keep the discipline process moving forward, there comes a point you start going, I don't need that. I don't need to worry about all of that. Uh, and the things that used to have such an alluring appeal no longer have much an alluring appeal. You learn the contentment that Paul talked about in 1 Timothy 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You brought nothing in, you're taking nothing out. If you have food and clothing with these, we should be content. And as all of these attachments of the world lose their importance to you, and the focus of heaven and the eye of faith sees into heaven better, and then it's sweeter as the years go by. It's a more glorious life, not because of what's happening on planet Earth, but because of what you're anticipating that's happening when you're leaving this Earth. And we're all leaving, whether you're an atheist or the most faithful that ever walked, we're all leaving. It's just a matter of when. So as we learn to adjust our focus and be content with wherever we are in this earthly life, which is temporary, and we start focusing on laying up those treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and thieves don't break in and steal, ah, there's where it gets sweeter. And as the years go by and as you see your treasures accumulating over in heaven and you see that they're starting to really outweigh what you've accumulated on planet Earth, which you can't keep anyway, and you see that that's eternal, it sure does bring a sweetness that is um, a little hard to describe to someone who is not truly engaged in the discipleship that we're talking about. And then when we have this verse, and we had this one this morning also, when we start to understand what Paul is saying here, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, when we train ourselves to move our focus off of material temporary onto the unseen, where the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal, and we say, that's my treasure. That's the inheritance reserved for me in heaven. That's what Jesus went over there to prepare a place for me. Those things that will last forever. I won't have to worry about moth and rust. I don't know if you get a house over there or how it works. But if you get a house, you won't have to worry about painting it. You won't have to worry about heat and air. You won't have to worry about changing the filters or changing the vinyl siding or whatever it is. You won't have to worry about all of those things. Got an idea you won't have to worry about light bulbs burning out either. Now, I realize those are trivial things, but it sure makes heaven look a whole lot sweeter. Of course, we could use the revelation description, no tears in heaven, no death, no, none of those sorrows that we know. And as our vision of that becomes clearer through the discipline of Christianity, it's sweeter as the years go by. Now, those are all some general things. We come to our final point, and I want to ask you, how, how do you do that? How do you engage that discipline? How do you actually make the, you know, the old timers would say where the rubber hits the pavement. Where do you get your traction so that you can actually make progress? That, that's still a little hard to talk about because we are talking about intangibles, but I have a few verses and some ideas that I, I hope will be of help to you. One of the things you have to do is you have to examine yourself. 
You really, now this, is, this gets tough, but you just have to look at your heart. When you're thinking something that you recognize is inconsistent with Christianity, you just got to say, hey, self, what's up with that? Why am I having these hateful thoughts about anybody? I, you know, I don't care if we're talking about a personality on TV. God's son died for everybody. God said, speak evil of no one in Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Now, if I'm having hateful thoughts and making comments about people inconsistent with Christianity, I just need to stop myself in my tracks. I need to have my time, whether it's just setting my recliner with the TV off so I can look at my heart or turn the radio off while I'm driving somewhere and say, okay, self, we need to have a talk. Because what you said about the president or what you said about that congressman or what you said about your neighbor, that wasn't Christian. What's going on here? But until you're willing to look yourself in the face and say, okay, sinner, fess up, you're not going to get anywhere. As long as you're going, well, that's different. Politicians know they get to get dogged. That's what they get in the arena for. Well, I'm sorry, that may be why they get in the arena. That may be part of it by our Constitution and our laws. But according to Christianity, it's sin. And when there's sin in my life, I need to stop and go, whoa, wait a minute. Something's not right here. If it's just a wife rebelling against her husband, she needs to think about that. If it's just a husband not nurturing his wife as Christ did the church, he needs to stop and think about it. I don't care how big the surface event is. When anything in my life is not lining up with Christianity, I need to go, whoa, that wasn't right. What's going on here? And I need not just to look at the symptom of the problem, I need to get deeper and say, why did I do that? What, what, am I, what am I trying to do here in my life? And so I've got to examine my heart. I've got to look at my thoughts. I'm currently of the opinion that you cannot stop a thought from popping through your head. I've been of that opinion for a long time now. It may change someday, but I'm not ready to change it. But I am also of the opinion that you can keep it from roosting in your head. Somebody said you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can't. don't have to let them build a nest in your hair. And I, I think that's a very good way to say it. There are going to be thoughts that pop through your head sometimes, you know, because life happens. Now, when I dwell upon that thought, it's time for me to take that thought captive. It's time for me to get very serious. And again, I have to go back inside of me. I've said before, and I'll say again without hesitation, the most narrow, difficult part of the straight, narrow road is the part that leads straight through my heart and where I have to look there. And so one of the main things you've got to do is just constant, persistent, relentless self-examination of why am I doing what I am doing? Why am I saying what I'm saying? Why am I thinking what I am thinking? And this is all Bible-based if we're going to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's the only way I know to really engage myself, get some traction, and move forward. Now, another area that you need to look at is just what are you feeding your brain? Paul said, do whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report. If there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The old computer slogan, G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. You can take the best computer that exists on planet Earth today, which would be pretty phenomenal. It would be one of them super mega super computers. Program it wrong and you'll get nothing but garbage. If you don't program even a supercomputer right, you can't get 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's got to have the right programming. We're very much the same way. We keep dumping garbage in, and guess what we're going to get out? And so one of the things we do in our self-discipline is we monitor what we are taking in. Now, don't quote me exactly on this verse. I want to say it's Proverbs 3 and 5, where he said, Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now, the verse I quoted is correct. If my reference is off, that may be possible. But our hearts, our mind... You really want to be cautious about what you let flow in. Somebody said if he could just control the music, he could control a country. I forget who that was, but it hadn't been too terrible long ago. And it's true. You've got young people listening to garbage all day long inside their heads, and guess what they're out looking for? Garbage. Why? Garbage in, garbage out. That's the way life works. That's why we go to Psalms 101 and verse 3, which seems so stringent to people who are more materialistically minded, I will set nothing wicked before my eye. If it doesn't help me get closer to God, closer to heaven, move my spiritual discipline closer, then why do I need it? I understand there's some things that fall into that neutral category and that would be our little bit of rest and recreation and you've got to have some of that. But I don't need a constant steady diet of stuff that would fall into the category of, of wicked, inconsistent with my Christianity. And this is one of the things that you just have to do. Now, you keep plugging away and plugging away and plugging away. And one of these days, you'll notice that some of the things you used to enjoy, you don't enjoy anymore. And when it dawns on you that, hey, 
I don't listen to this kind of music anymore. I don't read these kind of magazines anymore or these kind of novels anymore. And you see that it's fallen away because you've gotten closer to God. As we sang in that other song, more about Jesus would I know? And you've gotten more of His fullness, His saving grace. As He's come into that greater understanding and you're maturing. And those would kind of be your birthdays, if you would, where you go, wow, I've made progress. And you will make progress. You just keep plugging away at it and plugging away. And again, I don't care if it takes you 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. The goal is to make progress. Whether we do it quickly or slowly, I'd rather do it quickly. But if it's slow, that's better than no progress. Also, man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. I usually use Matthew 4, 4 on this one. This is the original text in Deuteronomy 8, 3. And it's got to be a passion and a hunger for God's Word. And as you're reading the Word, it can't just be like, okay, I've got to knock out three chapters a day if I'm going to read this book in a year. And I do kind of like that year thing, but don't get all tripped up in the year. As you're reading it, you've got to be thinking to yourself, what's this mean to me? What can I get out of it? It's not just a quick reading. It's a, I've got a discipleship. I'm trying to move forward. Is there something in my reading today that can help me move my discipleship forward, fine-tune it onto higher ground? Now, maybe in some days there's not. I found in a whole lot of days there are. It's quite an interesting process when you do your reading with a view to your own heart. Mark 7, 21 through 23, again, we're back to the heart because this is where our discipleship really is at. From within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, so on and so forth. It's the heart. And the only one who can touch this heart is me. And the only one that can touch your heart is you. I can stand up here and I could yell and scream and spit or I could talk softly or somewhere in between, but I can never touch your heart. I might stir you up and I might make you think about it, but you're the only one that can do anything about it. And I'm glad God set it up that way. Isn't it wonderful that we can't mess with each other's hearts directly? We think we're messed up now. Can you imagine what it'd be like then? That's a horrible thought. So we keep getting back to your own heart. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I thinking what I'm thinking? And these things, you've got to be careful because if you're not careful... You'll put them out there in such an extreme thing. Thefts. Well, I'm not a thief. Oh, you're not. How's your contribution? I'm not a thief. Okay. How well are you using your talents for God? Well, I'm not a thief. Well, okay. How well are you giving God the time he deserves? You see, you see something like the word thefts, and you want to be careful that you don't make it the guy out there that you saw on Mission Impossible movies stealing the great jewels of London or something. You want to bring it home to a place that applies to me. Am I stealing mint Anison Kuman from God? Maybe I am a thief. Something to think about. You see, that's where I'm going to really get into making some progress. And finally, 1 Corinthians 9 and 27, I've got to bring my body into subjection. And here's an area that I want to challenge you on. I'm going to bring my body into subjection. And I want to, obviously, if we're talking about sin, you go, well, yeah, I've got to stop that. Amen. I, I think we'll agree with that. I want to challenge you to bring your body into subjection beyond just sin. I want to challenge you to bring your body into subjection and make yourself do the things that need to be done even when you don't feel like doing it because you'd rather sit down in your recliner and your body says, oh, I'm too tired. I want you to say, no, body, this is the time we're going to do it. Or when you're looking at whatever, schedules, food, caffeine, just stuff. Not that we're talking about matters of heaven and hell necessarily, but learn to take control of your body. Learn to truly be the boss of your body, of your flesh. So that when it does start moaning and groaning, you've got the reins firmly in hand and don't have to follow whichever direction the flesh wants to go. Now, those get in some areas that I really don't know how to articulate other than to say you want to truly have control of the body. Sometimes look at dessert and say, no, not today. Not that it would be wrong to eat dessert. You're just telling your body you're the boss and we're not going to do it today. Skip a meal. Read an extra 30 minutes instead of turning the TV on. Just little things, again, maybe no sin involved. I'm just saying the body's got some attitudes. It's got some routines. It's got some moaning weaknesses. And you're going to say, no, you're going to get up 30 minutes and read. I know you'd rather stay in bed, but you need to get up and do this. He disciplined his body. He brought it in subjection, lest when he preached to others, he himself should be disqualified. Take the control of the flesh, truly, in every aspect. A lot, of, a lot of area there we could kick around. Philippians 3.20, we'll, we'll bring it to a close. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's the main thing you want to keep your eye on. You're nothing more than a pilgrim here. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. That's a fact. 
if you're a Christian anyway. This world isn't your home regardless if you're Christian or not. And so you want to keep your eyes upon that main goal and keep moving toward it. And I do think that the closer that we get to it, it does get a little easier to, to see it, and it does get sweeter as the years go by. And then, of course, I want you to take confidence in what Paul said in the popular verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because you can. You can get to heaven. You can be successful. You can enjoy a Christianity that gets sweeter and sweeter as the years go by. And many of you sitting in here are thinking exactly that. You know it's been sweeter as the years go by. And you're glad you've been engaged in the discipline. And you're looking forward to the years that are to come because you're pretty confident that it's going to get sweeter still as the years roll by. If you're engaged in that process, stay the course. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. If you're not, it's time to examine your heart and make some changes. It may be private changes. That's fine. Make your changes in private. It may be that you need to make a public change. If that's the case, we're here to help you any way we can. While together we stand and sing.